I've never been both so hyped up for a game's release and then so incredibly disappointed at the same time as I was with 2007's Kane and Lynch, a dark, gritty third-person shooter developed by IO Interactive, a team who had a pretty damn solid development history beforehand. Like these were the guys who worked on the awesome Hitman series, which is one of the best trial and error and dress-up simulators ever made. Not to mention Freedom Fighters on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, something that's since become a bit of a cult hit. Kane and Lynch though was really the first time they had a bit of a chink in the armor and it got some pretty mixed responses when it first came out. I think anyone who was into gaming at the time and can remember reviews from that period can probably remember the reaction when Jeff Gerstmann, who at the time was working for GameSpot, released his mostly negative video on it. And to be honest, a lot of what he said was justified, not to mention balanced. At the time it was hailed as one of the worst games ever made, so let's jump into it and see what went wrong, shall we? Also, before we start, I gotta say this video is a Patreon request. So if you'd like to request more games, be sure to head over to my Patreon page and consider supporting the channel and leaving a comment. The story in this game is pretty damn edgy. You're playing as Kane, who's sent to death row in the game's opening. Probably for the crime of the amount of times he drops the F-bomb. Anyway, before he gets there, he's busted out by Lynch and a group Kane used to work with called The Seven. Just cover your head now! Turns out Kane apparently stole a bunch of cash from these guys and now they want it back or they'll kill his wife and daughter. Kane, we don't have time for this. We have both your wife and your daughter. Must have been a hell of a lot of money though considering how expensive it would have been to bankroll Kane's breakout, not to mention the heat they're gonna get from all this law enforcement. Turns out that the seven aren't the smartest guys though, like maybe the seven refers to the grand total of the IQ points between them because they decide to pair Kane up with Lynch, a guy who's a psychopathic schizophrenic who supposedly murdered his wife, and he's not all that good at hiding his fragile mental state. What are they for? Lynch frequently hallucinates, he has fits of rage, he goes ballistic on people's Discord servers at times, and he generally just repeatedly messes everything up, causing more headaches for our poor protagonist. I get blackouts, lose control, I don't know, sometimes it just clicks. I don't know how the seven expected things to go, but as you can predict, it just doesn't go smoothly. With almost every single operation botched and things going pear-shaped. People start swearing, they call each other assholes, and then the mission ends. And you start to understand why maybe every other character in this game just hates Kane so much when it does appear he's such a colossal screw-up. As bad as the story is though, and as useless as it makes the two main characters seem, like, I can't deny this game just has some really good voice acting, especially Kane and Lynch themselves. Kane is voiced by Brian Bloom, who's done the voice work for BJ in the recent Wolfenstein games, and he also did Jackie Estacado in The Darkness too. And this guy just sounds like an absolute badass, like you can really hear it in his voice, like it's not the type of person you want to dick around with. Just keep it cool. Same goes for Lynch too, I mean it's just a perfect choice for the voice actor, and you really do believe that this is some loose cannon psycho, who could totally switch gears in an instant and go into a murderous rampage. It's actually probably the one saving grace for the whole storyline, and watching these two quibble and argue throughout the campaign I think is like a definite highlight. Just do as I tell you and don't fuck around! Lynch, shut up! Is there a problem? It's like a buddy cop film, just instead of being cops, they're criminals. And instead of being buddies, they fucking hate each other. The original goal of the game is just to work with Lynch and retrieve stuff that Kane knows to the seven. Now this involves a bank heist, a highway and a subway chase, and a shootout in a nightclub before the game changes and you're going after the Seven instead, eventually chasing them to Mexico for the game's finale. Along the way they keep trying to develop this uneasy alliance between Kane and Lynch, but the constant jumping of locations combined with very little actual storytelling means that that part of the plot does come off a bit weak. I always thought the story in this would have been better off if Kane and Lynch knew each other prior to the events in the game. Like if Lynch was an old friend of Kane's that he was forced into working with despite knowing what a psycho the guy was, it would have really emphasized how Kane was really in dire straits. Maybe they could have been ex-special forces or something that worked together. Lynch's mental condition could be linked to PTSD and it would explain why they're both so good in combat and able to kill hundreds of people with ease, not to mention it could also detail how they got corrupted. Like maybe there was some kind of drug deal in Mexico they got mixed up with and tried to get a piece of, which would also make the Mexico finale feel like things coming full circle. A backstory, even if it's a backstory that's only mentioned in passing, just could have given these guys way more depth and made their relationship much more tenuous, which is the whole point of the game. Either way though, you can tell these are two guys that don't particularly like each other. I think it's safe to say if that one of them was dying of thirst, the other one wouldn't even piss in their mouth. And what is that supposed to mean? I have a deal with you. Yeah, right. 
Still, look, they do try, and some of the first few chapters are actually pretty dope and feel like you're in like a Michael Mann film. There's even a mission where you're just moving down a city street in broad daylight, gunning down SWAT with assault rifles. That makes me feel like Robert De Niro at the end of Heat. There's a shootout in a nightclub that also seems to be very similar to the shootout from Collateral, another Michael Mann film, and this is also pretty impressive that they were able to get so many NPCs in one place at the same time. It even feels like a real nightclub. I only played this mission for 10 minutes, but during that time, all I wanted to do was just go home and shower. Every chapter or mission usually plays out the same too, in the sense of it starting off pretty docile before it just erupts into gunfights, usually within like the first 30 seconds or so, then you just spend the rest of it killing enemies. You can carry two weapons, either a pistol or some kind of two-handed weapon, of which there's actually a decent variety. There's a P90, an MP5, a Colt M4 carbine, AK-47 and a couple more. Then you get a sniper rifle for a bit towards the end of the game. That's about it. Shotguns are included as well, but they're mostly dog shit, especially later in the game. All of the automatic weapons have similar recoil and accuracy aside from the sniper rifle, which is easily the most accurate weapon in the game. But it's kinda gimped because it takes literally 10 years to reload, and you get barely any ammo for it. Then there's some pretty basic squad commands. You can tell the guys in your squad to either follow or hold back. They'll also attack a certain enemy if you target it, but they seldom seem to do this, which is kind of annoying. Instead of dying, you're instead knocked to the ground, and hopefully someone's able to get to you and revive you with a shot of morphine. But if this happens too many times, you OD. This game also taught me that multiple bullet wounds can be healed if someone stabs you with a morphine syringe. Like, the more you know, right? You can expect to have to do this to your buddies as well, and if any of them die, well, it's mission over. Other than that though, it's just shooting and more shooting. Shoot all the things. If it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't move, shoot it anyway for being lazy. Kane and Lynch does have a pretty nonchalant way of handling violence, like you're just gunning down dozens and dozens of people in this game, often innocent people who happen to be caught in the crossfire, which kind of keeps with the game's edgy theme, and the whole thing just feels so mindless. Remember when you watch violent movies as a kid, something like Robocop or Total Recall, and you saw innocent people getting in the way of bullets during some of the action scenes? And at the time, it felt kind of shocking, but here for some reason in this game, it's the complete opposite. It's like watching someone shoot wallpaper. The enemies and the NPCs in this game are just a distraction that gets in the way of you moving onwards to the next area, where you'll just keep killing more of them, and as a result, they're more of a hindrance than a threat. Cannon Lynch also has a lot of weird design choices when it comes to the way that it handles shooting. So for starters, there's no reload button. Like, just let that sink in. Instead, the game's going to automatically reload after a second or two if you don't fire a weapon, which sounds fine and works in practice, but I mean, can you ever think of a third-person shooter with a realistic setting that didn't have a reload button? Another thing is that despite it being a cover shooter, there's no button to jump to cover. Again, just a weird choice. Now, I don't know if they did this to free up buttons for people playing on the console or something, but again, it just seems so odd to go against the grain for something so important. How this works is that when you're near the edge of a wall, Kane is going to snap to it automatically. Now, I guess the idea here was that it was supposed to be fluid or something and make it more seamless when you transitioned into cover. But instead, the game is going to distinguish what is and isn't cover, and half the time it just doesn't work. I just ended up playing the game like a more traditional third-person shooter, not really using cover at all and just sidestepping near the edge of something as pseudo cover instead. But I think what really annoys me though is how random the weapon spread is when firing guns. Basically, it means like what you're aiming at with your crosshair isn't really all that much of an indication as to whether or not you're even going to hit it, because bullets have a tendency to dart around the crosshair itself without actually going where it's intended. I don't like this because my accuracy and skill with aiming doesn't really mean all that much, because the way the game simulates weapon spread or recall means the shots won't go where I'm aiming anyway. What you have to do with enemies at longer distances is quite honestly just keep firing over and over, tapping that fire button until the game randomly lets a bullet connect. And they took this concept of bad weapon spread and made it even worse in the sequel, if such a thing was even possible. But let's not open that can of worms just yet. Truthfully, I don't mind the first few chapters, but things really go to shit once you get to Mexico, and at this point, it's almost like you're playing a different game. Now you're taking out helicopters, you're going up against armored tanks and guys on MG nests. Like, it just feels like it's shifted genres completely. It's not this gritty crime epic involving heists and blackmailing, it instead turns into a pretty crappy squad-based shooter. But it's one that's lacking those refined mechanics that make squad-based shooting enjoyable. On top of that, the enemy AI seems to be on steroids and your teammates have taken their idiot pills because they'll get knocked out constantly. One of the chapters in the jungle has you trying to avoid being detected by flares and it's one of the two times in the entire game where this lackluster stealth mechanic rears its ugly head. 
and I still have no idea how this works. All I do is just run around and try to kill everything before they can set off an alarm. And then towards the end of the game, it just becomes an absolute gauntlet as you move from one area to the next, taking on droves of enemies at once who are just able to melt your buddies in seconds. Like, it's just bad. What were they thinking? Now, there's a few reasons as to why these levels are as crappy as they are. I think they've quite clearly just been rushed, like they feel very copy and pasted, not to mention they're all very similar visually. But I also remember reading at the time that what these guys had done was basically take 90% of the content in these levels from a scrapped Freedom Fighter sequel, and then just recycle them into Kane and Lynch. Now don't hold me to that because I can't find any information about this online at the moment, and it doesn't help that one of the missions in this game is literally called Freedom Fighters. I wish I had some kind of citation for this, but I do remember it being discussed at the time the game came out. And I think this is the most logical answer to the whole thing, and also why these chapters just feel so juxtaposed to the rest of the game. Even though it only makes up 5 or 6 chapters out of the game's 16 in total, it easily takes the most time to get through, whilst also being, I think, the weakest aspect. Just get on your feet! We're moving in now! This is also one of Jesper Kidd's weakest soundtracks, which doesn't help. Some of the music this guy's worked on includes the Hitman games, Splinter Cell, Borderlands, and Assassin's Creed. But the stuff he's done in Kane and Lynch is just kind of forgettable, and it's a damn shame. Kane and Lynch actually had a pretty unique multiplayer mode as well, where you'd steal a bunch of stuff in a small squad fighting AI cops, and then you had the option to betray other players at the end by shooting them, increasing your own score. Would have been like Payday 2 in a third person perspective with the option to screw over your teammates. But playing this I think is almost impossible now because the online component uses games for Windows, which anyone's going to tell you is just absolutely horrible. And the only thing worse than games for Windows I think is Hepatitis C. And good luck finding anyone stupid enough to play with anyway. After the response this game got, you'd kind of think that would have been the end of it. Like IO Interactive would have just cut their losses and run away with their tail between their legs. Well, no, for some reason they thought it would be a good idea to make a sequel. So what we got was Kane and Lynch 2, Dog Days, which was released in 2010. And if you think this game is bad, well, Sunny Jim, you don't know how bad things could truly be. And in the next video, I'm going to show you. Then I will.